Thank you so much, Rachel and Lily, for your reflections on judgment of other people or even dealing with your own convictions. Today, we are going to talk about our own convictions. This brings to an end our four-week series called Otherwise, Gaining Wisdom from Others' Perspective. The first week was Other Boats, and the next week was The Other Nine, last week The Other's Son, and today The Other's Conscience. Have you enjoyed the series? I've enjoyed it immensely, just putting the messages together and preaching from God's Word. Well, today is going to be no different. Get your Bibles ready. We're going to be spending time in Romans chapter 14 and some of the surrounding passages. Before we get started, let's bow for a short word of prayer. Dear Lord, please help us to accept others without judging and to judge rightly without compromising our own convictions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Faith, morality, and conscience. Say those words with me, would you? Faith, morality, and conscience. One more time. Faith, morality, and conscience. It is because of our faith, our morality, and our conscience that some people are restricted from engaging in certain behaviors that others may engage in without restriction. So how do we judge rightly without compromising our faith, morality, and conscience? How do we accept others who have a different conviction than we do? And within religion, especially within our faith as Christians, we will not all agree biblically or theologically. I mean, we have hundreds of denominations, hundreds of thousands of churches. Why is this? In my opinion, it's because believers have not learned how to agree to disagree over what is called disputable matters or disputable matters of conscience. In fact, many Christians cannot even agree on what the matters that are disputable are and what the matters that are essential are. What's essential for you? What's essential for you? And even as believers, we're not quite sure how we agree on so many different issues. That's why at Bridgeway, when I started it 29 years ago, I wanted to start a non-denominational church, and specifically one that, what we say around here, major on the majors and minor on the minors, all right? Because without that, you'll have a lot of disagreement, and we'll just continue to segment ourselves. And so I did not want to limit our ability to reach people from any background. So then the question becomes, what are the majors? And with over, over 52 to 65 different nations that are represented in this church and people coming from so many different denominations, Baptists and, and Methodists and Episcopal and Lutheran and Greek Orthodox and Catholic, liberal and conservative, and we even have the frozen chosen Presbyterians. There are a lot of people that come to this church, and what we don't want to do is limit uh, the effect that we can have on so many different people from so many different backgrounds. And so what are the majors that we should major on? Well, we've just decided that we're going to major on those like five or six things. And all the other things, we're going to allow people to have differing opinions on, and we can still be unified. So what are those five things? Here are the five majors of the faith that we think about. One, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Two, man has fallen because of sin and in need of salvation. Three, man needs redemption or salvation from Almighty God. And four, that redemption and salvation comes through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who God the Father sent to live as a man to walk on the earth and to, to live sinless and perfect, dying on the cross through crucifixion. He, he then was risen again from the dead. And fifth, he's going to actually come back, the return of Jesus for those who are his followers and forevermore will live with him in heaven. And all of this is according to the Holy Scriptures, which we hold as authoritative, divinely inspired by God. 
So these are the things that are the majors. These are the ones that we say we're going to stake our claim on. We're going to stand on these. We're not going to compromise. But outside of just those five majors, based on the Holy Scriptures, which are inspired and authoritative, there are so many other topics. And friends, we've allowed ourselves as the church of Jesus Christ to divide over them. Baptism, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit, eating of different foods, drinking of alcohol, clothing and dress for, for women and jewelry and tattoos and, and hair, hats, Halloween, holidays, you name it. Worship days, Sabbath days, fasting, music styles, hymns, gospel, contemporary, instrumentation versus a cappella, Bible versions, communion rituals, women in leadership, dating and marriage and divorce and remarriage and contraception and abortion, homosexuality, cohabitation, that means shacking up, continue on, uh, race relations, politics, taking medicine, using marijuana, just to name a few. Some of you are mad already just because of the list that I wrote. You're wondering why my thing ain't on the list or why would you even put that on the list? There's a lot of emotion connected around many of these topics that I mentioned, and that's not the half of it. Churches split over such topics and have done so for generations. Bridgeway Community Church is not a cult. We are not trying to control people. A cult is a culture of theological legalism and control that goes beyond what the Bible says in order for people to be under the thumb of a religious leader or denomination, and we are not that. But even those that are not cults have still found a way to disunify and create new denominations out of old ones because of some of these topics, which... Not to offend to call them minor, we've just decided we're not going to split over them. You know, there's a joke of a man who was stranded on an island all by himself, realizing he wasn't going to be rescued, and so he decided he'd build himself a house, and over time, he built himself a little church, and finally, to his surprise, a boat came up, and sure enough, these people were going to rescue him, and he was so thankful, and so when they got all of his stuff and were about to rescue him, somebody observed and said, oh, I see you built yourself a house. Yes, I did. I knew I'd be here for a while. He goes, oh, it looks like you built, well, let's see, one, two churches. What? Why are there two churches and there's only one person on the island? To which the man responded, because we had a church split. <laughs> Listen, we can't even agree with ourselves. More importantly, we can't agree with one another. And so how do we do this thing called church unity? How do we stop from dividing over the issues that seemingly cause us dissension and draw fault lines all throughout denominational Christianity? Well, the Apostle Paul was dealing with these same exact issues in the first century church. And so then what he does is he lays down some guiding principles to help the church function as they navigate through such matters. He calls them disputable matters or matters of conscience. I'll call them today disputable matters of conscience. Now, in order to dive into what the Apostle Paul wants to say, he writes a letter to the Roman church. And in chapter 14, he really handles some of the issues that they were dealing with. So if you have a copy of the scriptures, why don't you turn to Romans chapter 14 with me. Pull it up on your phone if you want to. And get yourself ready to take some notes because I'm going to give you what I call the Ten Commandments to help Christians live together in unity over disputable matters of conscience. We may not ever agree on some of the matters, but what are some of the principles, some of the commandments that will help you and me live together in unity over disputable matters? Now, in order to set this, let me go ahead and read uh, chapter 14. It's a bit of a long read, but I think it's worth it because it'll set the background and then we'll give you the Ten Commandments. Listen to the word of the Lord. Paul writes, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. 
the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than the other. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Verse 7, for none of us lives, in himself, lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. Verse 12, so then, each of us will give an account to, of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to be a stumbling block, not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him, it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to stumble or to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating, his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. The whole passage of Romans chapter 14. They were having an issue with whether you could eat meat or not as Christian Gentiles, dealing with a culture where different foods had connected to it, what was clean and what was unclean. And now as the message would come to those that were not Jewish, the dietary laws were different. And sometimes because meat was sacrificed to idols or seen as unclean, how could you be a good Christian and still, eat, and still eat meat. And Paul adds in there drinking of wine as well. And so, so some cultures, the drinking of wine would be fine. In other cultures, maybe it was too, uh, too immoral to do so because of drunkenness. And then when you throw the drunkenness in with the spirituality and the eating of meat, what kind of church is this, right? And so what Paul does is he says, listen, as a Jewish man writing to Christians in Rome, let me give you some guiding principles that will help you. I call them the Ten Commandments to help Christians live together in unity over disputable matters of conscience. And here's the first one. Thou shalt accept 
one another. Thou shalt accept one another. The very opening verse, here it is, verse 1, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Turn to chapter 15 and look at verse 7 because that ends this whole entire thought process that Paul is talking about. And this is how he, he brings it to the other side or concludes it. He says in 15.7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What's the point? Paul is saying it's more important to accept people who have a different view than you on the disputable matters than not to. And the word accept also means the word welcome. So in other words, we don't want to say you can't come in, you can't get in because you don't hold the same convictions as I do. Paul says it's the exact opposite. Welcome people who have disagreement on the disputable matters. Accept them, even if they do eat meat. Accept them if they don't eat meat. Either way, whether they do or whether they don't. If we're not talking about a, a, a biblically uh, a strong major issue of the faith, let it go. Accept one another. Commandment number one, thou shalt accept one another. Commandment number two, thou shalt stop judging. Stop judging. Look at verse one, verse four, verse 10, verse 13. Verse one, accept him whose faith is weak without, here it is, passing judgment. Look at verse four. Who are you to judge? Someone else's servant. To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Stop judging because there's only one judge, and he can handle this. This person's not your servant. They're God's servant. Let God do the judging. If we want to live in Christian unity around the, dis the disputable matters of conscience, we must accept one another, stop judging one another. another. Third commandment, thou shalt start Loving one another. Look at verses 13 through 15. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Here it is, instead. So what am I supposed to do if I'm not supposed to judge? Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now check out verse 14. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in, its, in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. And if your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother whom Christ, for whom Christ died. In other words, listen, I may have freedom to eat meat, but if that person doesn't have freedom to eat meat, then don't destroy them uh, because of your freedom and because of your liberty. And so because I have liberty and I can do this, I can eat meat, I can drink wine, I can enjoy X, Y, and Z, and you can't. To do it in your face means that I'm the one who's guilty of not loving. And so what the text is saying is thou shalt start loving. Stop judging, instead start loving, which makes a, a, a very good point that you have to make the decision in your mind that I don't want to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in someone else's way so that they can't express their faith, morality, and conscience. Here's the fourth commandment. Thou shalt pursue the higher calling in Christ. Check out verses 17 and 18. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. What is the point he's trying to make? That the kingdom of God should not be divisive over these matters of conscience. Don't make your church, don't make your your Christianity about eating and drinking. Make it about the higher calling in Christ, righteousness, peace, joy. 
in the Holy Spirit. That is the, that is the higher calling. Pursue the higher calling of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do not lower the kingdom of God to the liberties that you have, but elevate it to, to the love you have for him and for others. Don't make it about the minor issues. That's why we have so much church disunity. That's why we have so many denominations. That's why we have so, many inf so much infighting within Christianity because we make issues that are disputable matters of conscience, major matters of division. And God is saying, don't lower the kingdom to those liberties. Lift the kingdom and pursue the higher calling in Christ. Well, here's the fifth command. We find it in verse 19. Thou shalt make every effort to pursue peace and mutual edification. Look at what verse 19 says. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. In other words, I, as a bridge builder, am, I'm going to make every effort I can to pursue peace with people who may have a different view than I have. That's what makes you such a good Christian, because you're making every effort to pursue peace and to pursue mutual edification. That's what good Christians do. Bad Christians are always looking to show what we don't agree on and why the other person's wrong. And then we want to call people out for being wrong instead of standing up for the higher calling of the kingdom, righteousness, love, joy, and the Holy Spirit, making every effort to build bridges of reconciliation and peace and mutual edification. What can we do together that will lift all of us up, not put people down based on the disputable matters? Which leads us then to the sixth command, which is now a thou shalt not. Thou shalt not destroy God's church over disputable matters. Check out verses 20 through 22. Listen to what it says. Verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Thou shalt not destroy God's church over these matters. There are a lot of people who go into churches and guess what they want to do? They want to change the church. And they want to destroy the church and bring division because of disputable matters. Now, they would never say, I want to destroy the church because of disputable matters. No, they just do it. <laughs> this matters to me. It matters so much to me. I think everybody ought to think about it the way I think about it. And before you know it, the choir is separated. Before you know it, families are separated. Before you know it, the pulpit's separated from the congregation. Before you know it, the clergy are separated amongst themselves. Because what happens is that minor issue becomes so major in their life, they believe that everybody else ought to think about it the way they think about it. And as a result, they begin to destroy the work of God instead of uplifting righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit pursuing peace and making every effort toward mutual edification. They destroy the work of God. Now, again, I don't know what your background is. I don't know where you come from with regard to your faith. But what I will say is this. The next time you feel this conviction to want to make a minor issue, a major issue, because maybe it grades you the wrong way, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is my conviction based on reverence or preference? Is my conviction based on reverence or preference? In other words, the conviction that I have, is it based on reverence for spiritual truth? And I believe that the Bible says that this is a major issue. Or is it based on personal preference, based on my family upbringing, my education, my cultural norms. 
I talked to one brother, and he says, you know, culturally speaking, when I came to Bridgeway, I saw people in T-shirts and, 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 and flip-flops and jeans, and, and I was brought up to always wear, you know, a, a suit, a tie. You dress your best for the Lord, you know, not your worst. It has no reverence to God at all. And now that same person is saying, but you know what? I learned something. I learned that it's not about the clothes you wear. And I realized that that was my culture growing up. And I still like to look good. And I still like to dress in a, in a suit or tie. But I, now I realize that that doesn't define the holiness of a church, right? That, that if somebody wants to wear a T-shirt and flip-flops and jeans, that's the culture that they grew up in. Or maybe they grew up in no church culture at all. I had to realize that that was not a major biblical issue. And can I just tell you something? When it comes to dressing, period, in church, it's always been an issue. There have been generations where they say women cannot wear jeans, should not wear jeans. That women have to wear their dresses so low and that if the ankles would show, there was a period of time, if a woman's ankles would show, that was her sign that she was a prostitute. And so now, you know, we're at a different time in a different place and women are always trying to figure out what to wear. And I've learned as a pastor you know, I think women ought to just talk to women about this. Because <laughs> men, we're messed up in the head. I don't think we really have it, have it clear when it comes to this. I mean, you know, you'll go to a club or you'll go to a bar, you'll go somewhere and you'll see a woman, she's looking so fly, she's looking so beautiful, she's looking so hot, even even sexy. Wow, baby, and then you're gonna get that number, you get that number, you go on a date, you start dating, you're like, man, she look good. I want everybody to see how good she looks. Finally, she becomes committed to you, and now you're like, yeah, I like people looking at you, baby, but not wearing that. And then if you marry her, it's almost like, wow, uh, you know, before I like what you wore, that's what drew me to you, but now I don't like what you're wearing because you're mine. <laughs> we're messed up in the head. Before we were married, I want everybody to see that. That's what I saw. I want you to see. And then you start walking with her, and you know, you know you're the man. When you got this beautiful girl on your arm, everybody like, wow. All of a sudden, you get married. It's like, nah, I don't want you. What, what? She come out the back, why are you wearing that? Oh, my word. Now, what, what you want everybody to do? What, you advertise it? I don't want nobody looking at my wife like that. What happened? We crazy in the head. That's what I'm saying. We crazy in the head. We can't handle it. We don't understand it. And a lot of people don't understand men are men. I'm a pastor. I still have eyes. Now, do I love my wife? Is she the most beautiful woman in the world? You ought to see her. I love this girl. She's awesome. Amber's the most beautiful woman in the world to me. But she knows it. You know it, too. I still have eyes. I'm still a man. It's not like the gospel, once I was blind, now I see. No, it's not like somehow, you know, once I was single, you know, and I, I, I could see everything. But now that I'm married, well, I'm blind. My eyes changed once I, once I got saved. My eyes changed once I got married. That's not the truth. The reality is I still have eyes. But men are so mixed up in the head, we're not quite sure what we want. And then women are trying to figure it out. Well, hang on. You thought, you thought I look good. Now you don't think I look good. You wanted me to go out with you. Now you don't want, what, what do you want? And so then when we go to the other extreme, I'm going to wear what I want to wear. I'm going to look the way I want to look. And so they don't know what the rules are. If I show my ankles, am I a prostitute? Can I show my knees? When I was at Moody Bible Institute, they actually had a rule. They're two inch, two inch above the knees. That was it. What do you do? Well, again, men are crazy in the head. We can't necessarily figure this out for women. I think men ought to talk to men about it. We ought to talk about second looks. We ought to talk about appreciating beauty versus lusting and all that. We ought to talk about that. But women, y'all need to talk to women because we're confused in the head. And personally, I think it's okay for a woman to, to accentuate her body, you know, and de-accentuate the areas that you, you don't like so much. I mean, I think that, that that makes sense. But there's a difference between accentuating your body and advertising your body. Where that line is, you have to figure that out before the Lord. But that's why I say, is it reverence? or preference, reverence for God and the word of God, or preference. This was the way I, I was brought up. All right, let me keep moving. Here's another thou shalt. Number seven, thou shalt keep your beliefs to yourself if exposing your freedom will hurt someone else. Thou shalt keep your beliefs to yourself if exposing your freedom will hurt someone else. I hope you're writing these seven things down. Check it out. It's verse 22 that goes with this commandment. Listen to what the apostle Paul says. So whatever you believe about these things, here it is, keep between yourself and who? God. 
Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. Now, there's a difference between discretion and deception. I mean, don't go out here saying, well, pastor said I can get drunk as long as I do it at home and nobody else is looking. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Don't misquote me. I mean, sin is sin, whether you do it in private or in public. But there is discretion. And keeping your beliefs to yourself and your convictions to yourself to some degree between you and God is a good thing or you and other people who may have the same convictions. But to allow those liberties to come out and to allow those liberties to be done in front of anywhere, loosey-goosey, it doesn't matter where you are or who you're with, you're just going to talk the way you want to talk, you're going to drink the way you're going to drink, you're going to smoke the way you're going to smoke, you're going to do whatever you want to do because you're being real is not actually biblical, it is foolish. It's not about being two-faced. It's about loving people around you enough not to cause them to stumble, and so discretion is important, and there's a difference between discretion and deception. There's a difference between private and secret. Let me give you number eight. It's a thou shalt not. You ready? Thou shalt not cause yourself to sin by violating your own conscience. Don't cause yourself to sin by violating your own conscience. We see it in verse 23. Check it out. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating. His eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. In other words, just because other people are eating meat, you were brought up different, and you've not been freed up. You've not been liberated. But because everybody else is doing it, you're like, well, then I'm going to do it. And what happens? You feel guilty. Your faith, morality, and conscience is challenged. And as a result, you don't feel like you're connected to God because you allowed your conviction to be violated because of other people's freedom. Now, can convictions change? Of course they can. When you grow in your faith, when you come around an environment uh, that's, that's different than yours, it helps you to grow. And then you realize, well, maybe wearing a suit and tie is not a biblical thing. Maybe it's not about, about reverence. Maybe it's about preference. Maybe it's about my cultural upbringing. Maybe it's about what my mama taught me, what my grandmama taught me. So convictions can change. But at the same time, if you put on a baseball cap, a T-shirt, flip-flops, and some tight little skinny jeans, and you come to church and worship, and you realize you can't worship the Lord that way because you've never done that before, and you still don't like the way it feels, and it doesn't tie you close to God, and it just doesn't tap into your deepest self, then listen, don't keep doing that and wondering why you can't feel like you're close to God anymore. You were different, and now you're in something different. Maybe the progression for you it's taking the tie off, taking the jacket off, and still being in a college shirt, some slacks, and some nice loafers. What am I saying? We all change over time. Our environment, our culture begins to show us. Is it reverence for biblical truth, or is it actually just preference that I still highly value? But what you can't do is to cause yourself to sin by violating your own faith, morality, and conscience. And that's why he says, whatever you do, you must do it in faith. If you eat meat and you're not supposed to be eating meat because of the way you were brought up and the way God spoke to you, then you violate your own conscience. And now you're destroying yourself because whatever is not done of faith is sin. You got to be able to do it. In you got to be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm cool wearing beach wear to church. You know, as long as they say I, I, I can come in, I'm cool with that. Because it doesn't violate my conscience. But don't violate your conscience because somebody else is free. Just because somebody else can have four Krispy Kreme donuts and not feel guilty at all doesn't mean that your diabetic, weight challenge, high blood pressure, gout walking self can eat the same thing when the doctor told you not to do it. <laughs> Everybody else can go to happy hour with the company. And you can go to happy hour with the company, but you've gone enough times to know that after happy hour, things begin to turn into crazy hour. I'll, I'll say that. And you know that there's a point in time when you might say, you know what? I can't really go to happy hour with y'all. You go with somebody else, but it changes. What am I saying? 
Thou shalt not cause yourself to sin by violating your own conscience. Here's number nine. Thou shalt, are you ready? Look out for the marginalized as a gracist. Look out for the marginalized as a gracist. Other people who might be struggling in the environment. Check out chapter 15. Now, I didn't go to 15 much, but let me go to 15 and just look at the first two verses that goes with this commandment. This is what it says. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. See that? That's what gracists do. Listen, it's not about me. I want to please God. I want to serve you. So what's for your good? I know you're coming over for dinner, and I know that you don't drink alcohol. Why would I pour wine for myself if I know that that's going to cause you to stumble? If you invite me to your house and you don't drink alcohol, why would I bring a bottle of wine and say, go ahead and crack that open for me? Are you that much of an alcoholic that you have to have it? What's the point? The point is simply this. As a gracist, I see who's marginalized and who's uncomfortable. And, and, and if I'm the gracist in the room and someone's having a hard time with the setting, a difficult time at the happy hour, I'm going to speak up. I'm going to shut down the conversation. I'm going to escort them out before things go south. Because I know when we go to the family holiday dinner, everything is cool until Uncle Johnny gets a little bit too much to drink. And before you know it, his racist mouth starts, starts coming out. And he starts talking things that he shouldn't be talking. His hands start moving in places they shouldn't move. So you know what? It's dessert time. It's about time for us to leave. Because I'm the gracist in the room. I I'm going to say this is a great time for us. It's been really great being here, been great being with everybody. We're going to leave now because we know what the protocol simply is. Everybody eats, everybody has dessert, then everybody starts drinking, and before you know it, crazy Johnny starts getting on his thing. Listen, maybe that's the time for you to see that there's somebody who's really, really uncomfortable with the conversation. They're really uncomfortable with the language. They're really uncomfortable with the humor. You're the gracious. You're looking out for them, and you're helping them in the environment. You may be shutting down a conversation. You may be saying, you know what, let's not talk about politics right now. Maybe it's all Democrats in a room and there's a couple of Republicans and the Democrats are going on and on and on. And you, as a grace, says, you know what, hey, how about we uh, start talking about something else? Maybe it's a bunch of Republicans in the room and a bunch of Republicans at the shop. And then there's you and you, you are a Democrat. And, and maybe there's somebody else that says, you know what, uh, maybe we, we should stop talking about this. The grace in the room is always looking out for the marginalized and that's what God is asking us to do. Marginalization happens in churches. And it may not be about politics, but it could be. It may not be about race, but it could be. It may not be about eating and drinking like it was in this text, but it could be. Whatever it's about. If you see that someone's marginalized, somebody doesn't fit in, somebody's not comfortable, remember what it says in 15, 1 and 2. You who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And in verse 2, each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. All right, let me give you the final of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt check yourself when your conscience is conflicted. Thou shalt check yourself when your conscience is conflicted. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to flip back to, uh, to chapter 12. We were in 14 mainly. We hit 15 a little bit. Now back up to chapter 12 for this 10th, uh, for this 10th commandment and look at verse 3. This is what it says. I quote, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather, here it is, with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, if you're going to judge someone, judge yourself. But Pastor, what do I do when my conscience is conflicted by someone else's behavior? Remember faith, morality, and conscience? If you're conflicted over reverence for God's word and God's truth, then maybe you should address it privately with that person about the behavior. But if what they are doing is not sin and it's just your personal preference, then maybe what you ought to do is kindly excuse yourself if you can't keep yourself from judging or being conflicted. Sometimes the best way to check yourself 
is to excuse yourself. I mean, this happens all the time. It even happens in my own home. Certain movies we like, and, and certain people really love gory, bloody movies, not necessarily my thing, but whether it's movies, whether it's secular music, at the end of the day, sometimes you have to excuse yourself because maybe something goes too far for you. This happened with my daughter one time, uh, Asia, who's 21, and Amber and I were watching a movie, and, and we were fine watching the movie. And so she comes in and she sits down with us. After about five minutes, she says, love y'all, good night. <laughs> she excused herself uh, because it was, it, was so, it was so violent. There was violence in, in the movie. And, 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 and here's the thing, you think, well, pastor and his wife are watching violence, but you don't understand. There, there's something about context. You, you got to know the context. You're right. They shouldn't be killing one another and cutting each other's heads off and shooting one another. I mean, that, you call that entertainment? That's terrible. My daughter comes in and she's like, oh, no, see y'all later. Good night. Mwah, peace out. And I get it because when she sat out, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's so violent. But when you're in the context, you're like, oh, get them. Kill them. Get them good. And you're like, who is that person? Yes, I'm the pastor, but I'm sorry. If I'm watching a movie like Taken with, with Leon Nelson and they stole and kidnapped his daughter and they're turning her into a, a druggie and a prostitute and now he has a very set of skills that has been given to him and he's going to fly over and he's going to go rescue his daughter and he's killing people and cutting them off. And you're like, yeah, get them, get them, because you have context. And if anybody sees you in that moment and doesn't understand the context. So we've got to watch ourselves. And that's why you got to think about other people. And Amber and I, you know, we went out to a play with a couple. They wanted to treat us to this play. It's supposed to be one of the hottest plays out there. I won't name the play because some of y'all might really, really like it and they think nothing's wrong with it. And here's the thing. Maybe we would have too. But we went with this couple. And they were from the church. And they wanted to treat us. And we go to this nice theater, and we get all dressed up, and we're sitting down on the floor, and we're watching it. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, 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 ooh. Well, you know what? Maybe if it was just Amber and I at home, but not with this other couple and people in a public place. Oh, no. So guess what? They were feeling more uncomfortable than we were. We all were uncomfortable. So guess what we did? We all got up and left. Why? Sometimes the best way to check yourself is to excuse yourself. It was a highly risque performance, and that in mixed company was not where we needed to be. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I'll be watching a movie, like I'll be in, I'll be in a movie theater. This is back before COVID, and it'll be something really funny, and I'll laugh out loud. The lights are all off. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so funny. <laughs> and then when the movie's over, the lights come on, someone's like, hey, pastor. I'm like, oh, snap, Lord, have mercy. If they hear me laugh, see me laugh, that was so inappropriate to laugh at. I can't believe I laughed at. I mean, the, the reality is all of us have faith, morality, and conscience, but context is so very important. Well, listen, sober judgment means I'm not going to judge other people. I'm going to judge myself. I'm going to thank God for the grace in my life. How are we going to end this? Let me review these 10, and then I'm going to close in the prayer that actually Paul prayed in Romans 15 for these very Christians he was writing these commandments for. Number one, thou shalt accept one another. Thou shalt stop judging. Thou shalt start loving. Thou shalt pursue the higher calling in Christ. Thou shalt make every effort to pursue peace and mutual edification. Thou shalt not destroy God's church over disputable matters. Thou shalt keep your beliefs to yourself if exposing your freedom will hurt someone else. Thou shalt not cause yourself to sin by violating your own conscience. Number nine, thou shalt Look out for the marginalized as gracist. And finally, number 10, thou shalt check yourself before you wreck yourself. No, I'm just kidding. I just wanted to say that. Check yourself when your conscience is conflicted. Let me close out in prayer right now with this benediction. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.